There are so many of us committed to improving the lives of the youth in our communities. The In It For Youth podcast is a place for us to come together, from professionals who work with and serve youth to those that champion issues affecting children, to community advocates and stakeholders, and insightful young minds too. The In It For Youth podcast is a tapestry of voices united by a dedication to youth well-being and empowering the young generations of today and tomorrow. I'm your host, Jamie Gale, and I'm so glad you've joined me on this team that is In It For Youth. Hello and welcome back to the show. Today's episode is a really special one. It'll be a little bit different in style than the others, and it's designed to be a really helpful resource for anyone who has kids or works with kids as we all prepare for the school year to wrap up and summer break to begin in a few short weeks. I'm joined today by an expert that I have just been so eager to have joined me, and you're about to hear why. My guest today is Rachel Yakar. Rachel is an experienced occupational therapist who owns a private occupational therapy practice in Lake Tahoe, California, where she specializes in pediatrics, working with children and families to improve their lives. Rachel is also a mom to two amazing kids and is active in her community through volunteering, teaching knitting and yoga, and serving as county commissioner. Rachel has her bachelor's degree in human development and family studies from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and her master's of occupational therapy from Midwestern University. If I told you how long that Rachel and I have been friends, you would know exactly how old I am. So it's especially (laughs) rewarding and special that our professional lives get to cross paths in this way. Congratulations on all of your impact on youth well-being, Rachel, and welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's such a pleasure for me to be with you to share, but also just to be together. This is a wonderful opportunity. We were talking before about how this is just like another one of our chatting conversations. So uh, this is really, really fun. So I'd love for you to start by giving listeners a picture of your current work with kids and families. Can you fill us in on all the ways that you're working to make a difference and then also what you would describe as your area of expertise within the field? Absolutely. So I own a private practice called Summit Therapy Solutions in Lake Tahoe, California, and I provide more of a non-traditional service where parents and families and children can decide the method of treatment that's right for them as a family unit. So I see kids one-on-one in a really amazing physical therapy clinic where we move and grow and develop and talk and play games together to meet treatment goals. I also see kids in their homes where they get to show me the natural environment and I learn exactly what's happening in their spaces and how they interact with their family, which can be really effective and efficient for families. And then I uh, use a parent's consult model where I meet with the parents over Zoom and we dive deep into the strengths and needs of the children. So that's my private practice. I also work with another occupational therapist who focuses on fall prevention for the aging population, people who live independently. But in Tahoe, we have all kinds of weather and risks and we try to help people stay healthy through all of their activities. So she sees adults through the lifespan. So I work closely with her. I'm also, as Jamie mentioned, a county commissioner for First Five in El Dorado County, where we delegate funds and support community members and staff in the public health department who are working with the Birth to Five community. And we're working really hard on literacy projects right now because we all know the benefits of reading. Yeah, so that's really exciting. And I just took a new contract with a wonderful growing company called Conspire, which is an app that parents access through their phone to provide occupational therapy treatment using that parent consult model. But the app is super robust with goal setting and treatment planning and articles and activities and chat functions where uh, us as occupational therapists can communicate directly with families and really support families all the time, uh, given their strengths and needs. And then I have two boys who um, 
keep me and my partner very busy on the ski hill and surfing and biking. And I basically chase everyone around. <laughs> so that's kind of me and what I'm doing. Amazing. We could do a whole other podcast episode about this app. That sounds really interesting. But I, I know that people are going to wonder, is it accessible by state or who who can use an app like that? Great question. So it's growing really fast. I did a little bit of research because I'm not a licensed occupational therapist in Wisconsin, but there is an OT license in Wisconsin working for Kinspire. So uh, I am licensed in California and Nevada, and they're working really hard to bring in a therapist license in lots of different states. So if you're curious about it, and you want to learn more, just head over to the Kinspire app or the website. Cool. That's really cool. I feel like everywhere I go, people are in need of more support and services. That's awesome. Okay. So one thing that I really love is the way you talk about occupational therapy and how you explain what occupational therapy is as a whole. And then in the context of kids. And so I just love if you could explain how you kind of give your elevator pitch for that. Cause I think the way you explain it really paints the picture. Thank you. So I know nobody really understands what (laughs) occupational therapy is or what OTs do. And they're like, do you get people jobs? Do you retrain people's hands how to work? And yeah, maybe we do that. But as an umbrella, what we really do is we work with our clients to help them manage, improve, find meaning, and enjoy the activities that they're going about doing on a daily basis. So for kids, when I think about what activities our kids are doing, it's play, it's school, it's sleep, it's eating. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I focus on. And then in, in that area, it's like, you know, if I'm working with a family where a child is a picky eater, I always start with saying, Well, this is never just about the food. Mm. It's about the whole bigger picture of the child's nutritional needs, how their body is functioning and working. Are they feeling okay? But then like, what are the pressures around mealtime? Where are they sitting in their home? What's the positioning like? Is there a lot of sound around them? Maybe they're sensitive or maybe they're not sensitive enough to the cues around them. And we, we take it from... Um, a really holistic, I call it a biopsychosocial perspective, where we're looking at all the things. And it's a system model that is so individualized to the clients and their family. So can you just quickly do a little definition of that biopsychosocial model that you were talking about? Because I think that that will feed really nicely into our conversation for today. Absolutely. So, so we look at like the biology of the individual. Okay. That's their physiology. It's what's making their bodies work. How is their body working? Then we look at the psychological piece. So we've gotten the bio piece. Now we're onto the psychological piece. How are they feeling in different moments? Are they anxious? Are they calm? Are they excited? Are they sad? Are they mad? Are they happy? All of those things, all the universal feelings. What's happening and how are they interpreting that feeling behind whatever they're experiencing? And then the social piece. So who is around? Is it, is it their family? Is it a teacher? Is it their friends? I know we're going to lean into some other really important social relationships. So it's the social piece too. And that when you put all of that together, what do we see? And what are the child's and the family's strengths? you know, what's really supporting them in these moments and uh, what's really hard. And and how can we find that balance of using the child's strengths, using the family's strengths to support their needs? Okay. That was, that was great and super helpful. You know, our listeners are people who work with and serve kids, but like in so many different areas. And so it was helpful to hear that from your lens. Rachel and I are both moms and youth serving professionals. And one of the things that we both see around this time of year is that families have this image of what a perfect switch over into summer mode is going to look like right as school wraps up. We imagine camps and pool time and camping trips and picnics, but then summer arrives and like a few days or weeks in, everybody is ready to tear their hair out. And I should also mention that a big part of who both Rachel and I are is that we are quote camp people. Not only did we grow up going to day camps and overnight camp, 
but we both have spent a good chunk of our adult lives working at summer camps. Most recently, Rachel served as the camp care coordinator at an overnight camp, and I work as a day camp director. So when it comes to this setting up for summer topic, we both have personal and professional reflections, and we see that there are some really important things that can be put into place to ease everyone's transition and best set kids up for success in summer. We know that the pieces of this really vary by age of the child. And so we're going to break it down in that way. But first, Rachel, I'm curious, what do you see as the biggest opportunities for families about summer break or the summer season in general? And what do you see as the biggest challenges for families overall? So we'll start with opportunities because that's the fun stuff. I mean, we all look forward to summer. It's a different, it's for sure a different vibe, a different energy in our house. The weather is hopefully beautiful. We get to engage in all the activities that feel fun, Mm -hmm. but maybe like more fun, (laughs) but there's also so many expectations with that. Like it better be good, right? Right. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So for all the reasons, like We understand we're spending a lot of money here. We really put a lot of pressure to like get into the right programs. (laughs) There are wait lists. So there's there's all that anticipation, right? A lot of us are just so excited. And And there's opportunity there too. That can be really healthy for a family to be excited about new activities in the summer. So just even like holding on to that excitement, talking to our kids about what are they excited about? I think there's a lot of opportunity to give kids of all ages a certain amount of autonomy in what they're going to do over the summer because during the school year, they're so structured at school. And for some kids, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. And that structure should, if it is amazing, that structure should carry through to the summer with like some explicit expectations. However, that structure can also feel hard during the year. And so in the summer, or really giving opportunity, giving space for kids to say, hey, this is what I want to do in the summer. And it doesn't have to be every day for sure. Or it can be like moments in a day where kids get to exercise autonomy. And that's an opportunity for them to say, this is what I want to do. How can we make this happen? Especially if, yeah, if, if that can be like a healthy conversation around meaningful activities because they can experience a lot of growth there. So, so much excitement for kids to do creative things and experience things that they don't necessarily get to do during the year, for sure an opportunity. Another opportunity is just time, right? We have a lot of time at our fingertips in a lot of families in the summer. And Using that time to, I love just like embracing boredom. I say to my kids all the time, if they say they're bored and they know better, they know that that's really not something that can be said in our home because I go, oh, you're feeling bored? What an exciting time to get creative. (laughs) I'm sure that goes over great. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So they don't really mention that anymore. (laughs) But um, it is is true. Uh, I think that, you know, that boredom can really spark creativity in a special way and in a different way than during the school year. So that's an opportunity. Some of the hardships, for sure. What are we going to do with our kids this summer? right? Like, how are we going to get through a day or a week or the whole time when there isn't that structured time? And there can be like a lot of fear and anxiety around that. There can be just like that unknown. We don't know what it's going to feel like. We kind of do know what school feels Mm -hmm. like the school year we know. And imagine that anxiety and unexpectedness for our kids Mm -hmm. is even bigger Mm -hmm. because they're younger, their brains aren't as developed and they just don't know what to expect. And that can be hard and a real challenge. So I think there's a lot that we can do to set them up for success and to set us up for success with that. Yeah, I totally agree. And it's just so interesting. You know, my kids are all teenagers and they're all old enough to you know, stay home alone if I needed to go run an errand or something like that or during my work. But I realize how different that is now than even a few years ago. And I, my feelings, like my internal feeling about summer break from school is so different than it was 
even a few years ago when I felt like, oh my goodness, I'm going to have all this time to fill. And I was texting, I have a group chat with my two sisters and our kids span from ages one to 17 between the three of us. And so I was saying like, oh, I'm just, I am so ready for summer break. Not only because my kids are at an age when like that time is a benefit in the summer for our ability to do things, but also my work shifts to camp mode. And so I I really love camp season, summer camp. So I'm really excited about it. And one of my sisters was like, oh my gosh, no, I'm dreading that. And it reminded me it changes so much over the years. And personality wise, we have different needs as parents or as teachers or as other professionals for structure and real consistency and all of that. So we have to take into account like our own needs, but then also the needs of our kids, which could vary dramatically from, from ours. And some kids do really well with the variability, but others do need more of the structure. And so parents, teachers, camp staff are often it's babysitters in summer when parents work schedule doesn't change in the summer, but their kids does obviously when school is out. So you know, these adults and kids' lives need to offer more support to make summer a win-win to their kids. And so I'm curious, what are some signs that adults can look for in their own kids or in their students that might be a cue that those kids actually do need more structure or support during the summer? Absolutely. That's a wonderful question. And I think as parents, I would say to parents, you know your kid. You know if they need a baseline routine. When I think about my clients, every client needs a baseline routine of some kind. Sometimes it can be as simple as we come downstairs and we have this for breakfast. And then we sit down and we talk about how are we spending our day? Or it has to be like the calendar on the refrigerator that explicitly says what is happening every day. And I, I think we have to meet kids where they're at with this. And it's when, it's the adult who has to really set the kid up for success. And I always suggest like use an investigative lens. What does your child need? What will support your child? Do they need like a very detailed hour by hour routine knowing that it's not going to go as planned? Or do they need more of that open-ended? This is the big picture of what we're going to do today. And you can fill it in as it's right and feels right and feels good based on based on certain parameters. Think about your kid ahead of time so that you can successfully plan to make it successful. Totally. You bring up a a good point that we have to actually look at our child, you know, sometimes we see that parents love the openness of summer or they're off for a couple of weeks in summer. And so they don't want to schedule for once. They don't want to schedule. But if your kid is someone who you're just starting to see, like some cues could be that they're melting down earlier in the day, or they suddenly are not eating on the no- their normal schedule and they're getting cranky because of it. Or you're like, what? Where, you go somewhere and you think, oh my goodness, my kid usually loves this activity. They love going to the pool. They love swimming. But all of a sudden you're seeing behavior issues or you're seeing meltdowns. Those could be cues that any of the needs that you were talking about before and any of the categories aren't being met, but that maybe some structure might help. And you brought up the schedule on the in the kitchen. You know, that goes exactly along with what I always recommend. It's something I've used with my own kids at, at camp and any of our programs. We always do this. And that is to make it visual. And so create a visual schedule. Like you mentioned, sometimes the best laid plans are going to get mixed up. It's going to be raining on the day you plan to go have a picnic in summer or whatever it is. But sort of coming up with a language with your kids about, and this could go for any age. I know we're going to break it down by age, but whatever their developmental level is, making something visual, pictures if it's younger, an actual written out schedule, a calendar of the week, what's what are days that are going to be relaxing days and what are days that you're going to be on the go? Those are things that I see really help. Or if you run a program, taking the extra few minutes to put the schedule up on the wall. So a kid who does need to kind of feel what's coming next can look up and be like, okay, my group just had art. Next we have swimming or whatever it is. Create some sort of visual prompt. And One of the things, I'm sure that you have lots of tricks in this toolkit as well, but one of the language 
pieces that I use both at home, not so much anymore that my kids are older, but, and with my students or campers is we have two, two phrases. One is this is a question mark time. So if we're writing out the day and it's like, oh, we're going to have this and this between two and five, we don't know what it's going to be. This is a question mark time. But then after that, here is what the plan is going to be. So it can allow stretching that growth edge of tolerating boredom, tolerating open space, feeling that openness, but within the container. And then the other word that we use is a zigzag. And so sometimes it's a picnic. Your plan on the schedule was to go to a picnic and play at the park for a couple hours with neighbors. Suddenly it starts raining. Okay, kids, it's a zigzag. We need to figure out what we're going to do instead. So those are just two recommendations that I have and I've seen work really well. Yeah, I I love that. One one that I might add would be it doesn't this is across the ages from maybe like 18 months to 18 give the child a job. So it can be grab a snack to put in your lunch and you've picked out the snacks that you're okay with them eating, they can grab whatever they want. It can be bring your breakfast plate to the sink for us. It can be take the dog out for a walk. And, you know, as they get older, they actually have a job, which is wonderful. (laughs) They know what their job is. But really empowering kids to be part of the process, part of the day in a meaningful and helpful way. Mm -hmm. All humans want to do that. So that's a drive. That's like an innate drive, a natural tendency and urge to have an involvement in some way to participate in a meaningful way. So I think the more that we can do that too, helps them feel really good, especially in the summer, even if they are like, no, that doesn't sound great for me. (laughs) You know, (laughs) that's okay too. But um, having the expectations, because you don't want to take all expectations away when you know that they're going to go back to school in August or September. And then like, it's like, uh oh, well, here you go, teachers have fun with this. When like they've had no structure, no expectations. So I want to also encourage everyone to maintain some of that structure, maintain some of those expectations for success. Yeah, no, I, I definitely, I love that. And that's so true. And yeah, like you said, it creates the structure, the flow, the pattern, the feeling of contribution. I, I love that. All right, let's start to talk through the different ages. So I was thinking about the toddler preschool age. And so this summertime can be a time when kids are transitioning to new classrooms, if they go to full-time daycare, or if they are on summer break from preschool, suddenly they're home with parents or babysitters more. So what are some strategies that parents or caregivers of toddlers and preschoolers can use to help the transition into summer and to make summer great? Yeah. So I, for sure, talking about it in really clear and simple ways. So if it's a child who's transitioning to an older classroom, talk about what's exciting about that, the new teacher's name, who might be transitioning as well to the new classroom, what the classroom might look like and feel like. How is it going to be the same, which can feel really nice and safe? And how is it going to be different, which might be a little bit more anxiety producing? And all of that is okay. Helping them understand what the expectations can be and how it's going to feel consistent is going to be powerful for them. So that's that's one thing we can do with our little, little ones, just talking about it. Because, yeah, we might know exactly what it's going to be like, what they can expect, but they have no idea. This is so new. It's right. like they've never done anything like this before. And it's a really big deal. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes I see, well, if a parent has a more flexible work schedule in the summer they might feel the urge to like, oh, I'm just going to pick them up early or, you know, they think, oh, it's preschool. It doesn't matter. We're going to, we're going to alter the schedule. And for some kids that like actually does work great, you know, and some kids it can really throw them off. So I think that with that age, it's just really important. Like you said, if they can understand a schedule, they're old enough, especially at that older preschool age to talk about it with them. But then it's a balance, right? Let's say they do go to preschool still or daycare in the summer. You know, it's summer. It's so nice. You know, sometimes that can start to interrupt bedtimes that people want to stay out later. How do you feel about that? Like, do you think that that's sort of a never? Is it a case by case situation? Like, how do you balance that? For sure, case by case. Mm -hmm. I think it depends on the needs of the child and the family. So 
if a child is having some challenges with sleep, I think it, again, it depends on the family's uh, version of what feels right to them. It, maybe they're okay with different bedtimes and because it's so fun. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I know where I live, we have beautiful beaches and people want to stay at the beach until like late, late, late at night. And then they come home and they're, you know, we're all covered in sand, head to toe, <laughs> the car yeah. is sand, you know, uh, we, uh, you know, there's a lot to do when we get home from the beach and then like bedtime becomes a really late uh, situation. And that for some families impacts their whole next day because maybe sleep is interrupted. It's just hard to get to sleep. And so I would say, well, you know, it, it's about that balance, right? Like go have the fun at the beach, but no, like, Maybe you're going to have fun until 6.30 and then head home instead of 8 or 9 when the sun goes down. Mm -hmm. As many of you know, I am a mom and a business owner. And so my life looks like a bit of a juggling act. And I have a feeling yours does too. One thing that has helped me stay organized over the past, I cannot even believe I'm saying this, 13 years is that I have been using emails to help me coordinate my meal plans for each week. I am someone who does like to cook. I don't mind going to the grocery store or ordering a quick delivery, but making the decisions about what we're going to eat is the mental labor that sometimes is just at, I'm at my max with. So I have been using emails, E-M-E-A-L-S, for many years. And each week I get a menu emailed to me that is in the category that I want. So I might choose quick and healthy one month or the next month choose kid friendly. It's really nice. You can switch between your plans. And then each week you get a PDF with all of your menus. The ingredient list is separate. And I go through and I select the ones that I want to make that week. Some weeks I'm making a lot of them. Some weeks I'm only making one or two. The best part is that then I save the rest recipes and I keep them in a folder and I have them to refer back to on a week where I'm like, oh yeah, what was that that I made? Anyway, it just becomes a really wonderful resource for busy families. They have a really slick app. I actually do the printouts, but a lot of people use the app and you can select your meals from the meal plan. You can even order your groceries directly from many main stores. I just personally really recommend emails so much. It's helped me so much over the years and they are offering our listeners a special discount. If you use the code that's in the show notes to sign up, you will get a gift card from emails just for trying it. So give it a try. I'd love to hear what you think. I'd love to know which meal plan you make and maybe we'll be making the same meals on the same days, but I, I highly recommend it. It has taken away a lot of the mental labor of meal planning for my family. My kids like it because we're not eating the same things all the time. So go in the show notes, click the link or you can send me a dm on instagram i'm at jamie gale llc with the word meals and i will send you a link to get your gift card for trying emails i think that's like one of the hardest things is to actually be honest with yourself about how is your kid going to handle this and then maybe kind of getting creative maybe it's not an everyday thing but maybe once a month you take a late night and, and alter the schedule in that way but yeah okay now I'd love to talk about the elementary school age. This is like such an exciting summer mode age. It's prime time for kids to try summer camps. Some kids are in full-time camp or daycare, but others are in a different program every week, which is like you said, it's such an amazing opportunity in the summer to try new camps, try new skills. When we go to sports camp, when we go to art camp, all of that. And so that is a great opportunity, but also can be a challenge. And so I'm really curious, like, what are your best recommendations? What do you see works best on the family side? And then I'd love to talk about the programming side next. Absolutely. So on the family side, I think it goes back to, again, knowing what your kid needs. In the, my house, I have a child who doesn't need and will not thrive in an organized program. He's still doing a few because it's important. And there are activities that he really does find joy in and he loves. So he's willing to do a couple. And then I have another child at home who needs every day to have something going on that he knows exactly what he's going to. He asks in the morning, am I doing this or am I doing this? And he knows and he just, you know, he needs that. And I think it's about knowing what we can do as a family, right? That's a huge component. Like, how is this going to impact our work schedule? And how are we going to make this work? And where can we be flexible? Where can we not be flexible? And knowing that ahead of time and really thinking about it so that it's not like too much. I always mm -hmm. think like our culture just kind of leans into like all the things like, oh, this mm -hmm. sounds fun. This sounds fun. This sounds fun. This <laughs> sounds fun too. 
When really, yeah, they all do sound fun, but if we do all of them, that's not going to be fun. (laughs) Right. We're going to get the end of the summer and need a break. Yeah. Yeah. So use the summer as the break, find the break in the summer and hold on to that and just know that that is important too. So that's what I say to families. To providers, I think uh, being really clear about what your program offers and who is your target audience and serving that. And I think sometimes providers want to do it all. And that's beautiful because we want to reach and we want to serve and we want our program to be great for everyone. And knowing that like every program is not great for everyone, but knowing who your program will be great for is Mm -hmm. a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. Again, I think this idea of making it visual both on the program end and on the home end, I know we touched on that, but this age group, this elementary school age group, you know, younger middle school, this is like a prime area where they can start to feel mastery over what what is going to be expected of them, where the downtime is coming and knowing what to expect just sort of eliminates that mental noise of not knowing what the next day is going to hold. And so I, this is one area that I really see like, yeah, put up a schedule for the week. I call it like the family marquee, you know, put it down say, this is what we're doing. Anything, if there's a babysitter coming one night, cause p- parents are going to a concert, like put it on there. So kids know what to expect. And you're going to, like you said, have some kids who are going to know exactly what's on that schedule and are going to know exactly what's on the schedule next week and the week after that. And some kids who are literally never going to look at it and don't care, but at least just offering them that baseline of information can be really helpful. We were talking in preparation for this conversation about things that parents can do to help set their kids up best for success in the programs. And this is something, you know, as a camp director, and you were very involved in outreach to families in your most recent camp role at the overnight camp. We see this, we see this go right. And we see this really, you know, (laughs) not go right. And so I'd love to just chat about what are some ways that parents of this age group can bridge that gap between home and let's say a summer day camp or an overnight camp to really set them up for success. Yeah, so I think that the people planning behind the scenes, the program directors of these programs really want your child to, and I'm talking to the parents at this point, to to be successful, to have a great time, to learn, to grow in their program. And the more information the staff and the director has about your child, the better. So it can be anywhere along that journey of registration, like touching base. Is this program really right for my kid? This is who my kid is. These are my child's strengths and weaknesses. These are some of the concerns that I might have. This is what I'm really excited about. Your program excites me because it can offer this for my child. But I'm also a little worried about fill in the blank. And Mm -hmm. the ability to be transparent and honest in a collaborative way is only going to help that director understand who your child is and if your child is right for their program. And if they are right for your program, then how to help the staff best meet your child's needs in the moment. You know, I do think that often parents are concerned like, oh, I don't want to label my kid or, oh, it's not going to be relevant because it's just a week of camp. And this can go anything from that your child feels nervous about meeting new friends and doesn't always warm up on their own. And so sometimes needs a little bit of extra staff help all the way up through at school. They have help with regulation or they have OT breaks or that they have trouble sitting still when that's expected of the group. Those are things that are just So like you said, having that information makes all the difference because otherwise we're trying to figure your kid out in the moment as the camp directors or camp counselors, and we don't have that information and we know how to, you know, obviously you want to be able to trust that the camp is going to hold that information privately. But like you said, we want as camp providers, we want your kid to do great and have an amazing time. And having that information is, is the way that we learn about your kid really quickly. Yeah. And I think to the program director, I would say be on the other side, it's being really open to the information 
And then making an educated decision. Yes, my staff is equipped with the strategies and opportunities to support a child with these needs. Or you know what? No, at this time, we really can't. It doesn't feel safe. It doesn't feel like this can be supportive. It doesn't feel like the child's going to be super successful in this camp experience. But here are some opportunities that might be. Mm -hmm. And being okay with that. I think can be empowering for everyone. And on the flip side, an in-between would be like asking follow-up questions. Like just because you know one kid that has an ADHD diagnosis doesn't mean that you know all the kids. And so knowing that if you get information from a family as the camp director or unit head or whatever it is, that to be able to say, okay, great, that's helpful to know. Tell me a little bit more. What These are the things that we're going to be doing at camp. What are the ways that we can support your child through that. And then you allow it to be something that you're working on with the parents and parents in turn, allow it to be something that you're working on with the camp rather than a problem to be solved halfway through the week, because, you know, everybody's like trying all the things, but we don't have the background information. And so we, we don't know what your child is going to need. That's one of the things that we see as at camp work the best is when a parent says, Hey, I'd love to hop on the phone with you. Or like, here's a summary of this or at school, this is what works for my kid. Yeah. We might not need all of those interventions at camp, but it's sure helpful to know upfront what does work anywhere at yeah. home, at school, at other programs. So that would be my big plea is to, to share the information because it really is only going to help your child. Yes. And I, I love that collaborative approach. I love that you know, feedback loop of this is what goes well, these are the strategies, this is what happens at camp, this is, you know, what you can expect, this is how we can work together. And that there's that ongoing, open, honest communication back and forth. And that's what builds up the child's experience and strengths and helps them grow into having such a wonderful camp experience. And, you know, a lot of times the camp director might be very experienced and knowledgeable about all the different kids needs, but sometimes summer camp counselors can be, you know, high school, college age might not have the depth of experience that the camp director does. So the more information that you can give about who your child is and, and what they may need doesn't mean they're going to need it at camp so that the camp can provide that information to these, you know, sometimes young staff members. It might be that college age camp counselor's first experience with a child who can't touch certain textures without being really dysregulated or anything like that. In fact, that's was how my mind opened to this was at camp. I was a college freshman, a day camp counselor, and the camp director explained that, oh, hey, you know, if this child is not playing this game or activity, it could be because they don't want to touch the textures. They have some sensory integration difficulties, and so they might not want to do that. Just give them an out. And so I was able to notice when that child wasn't participating in that activity, even with my, you know, I was very young myself, but I was able to notice that and not think it was a behavioral thing or a, being stubborn or anything like that. I was able to see that that child was meeting their needs in that moment and that I could just support them in that. And no, no big deal. It was no big deal. And so those are just some little examples that of how just giving them more information up front, whether or not the camp is going to need it can be super helpful. Yeah, I love that. So if we move on up the age spectrum to the middle school and tween age children, because they still are children, you know, they this age might not want to be in camps all day. They want the decompression time from school. And that makes complete sense. They, again, might not need someone home with them all day, but they do still need some support and supervision. They might not need someone doing arts and crafts with them, but they certainly need somebody helping them. So I'm wondering what are some strategies to like help this age group transition from school to summer and then help them balance the decompressing from school need, but like also making sure that they're not just on screens, letting their mental health slump during the summer. Yeah. So the, I, this might be the hardest age group because they, they really don't want to do anything organized. Yeah. They've had enough with structure. They're ready to embrace just like not being in school. They for sure need the break. And they also need to be doing something, right? And we don't necessarily know what they should be doing. So I think it's really hard. 
Uh, so here I say boundaries, right? Like this is what you can, this is when you can do fill in the blank. And this is when you have to be doing something else. And this is when you're going to do something organized. And this is when you can do something, you know, on, on your own time, what you want to do. So really a, a, giving that, it's that push and pull of autonomy, decision making, finding things that are meaningful and fun for them on their own and empowering them with that. But also understanding that they do need structure. It doesn't have to be like by a schedule necessarily, but maybe it does. It just needs to be some sort of consistency and ex with explicit expectation, not mm -hmm. only for their safety, but for their well-being and for maybe, you know, some sort of like school adjacent <laughs> projects that are happening. Some kids have reading requirements. Some kids need to be reading. Some kids love to read. So it just, again, it really depends on that kid. And reading is not the only thing, of course, but really like finding a way that they can engage in something, like I said, school adjacent can be helpful just to kind of like keep that thread going to so that when they don't, again, when they go back in August or September, they're not like... I have no idea how to do this anymore. <laughs> right, right. Totally, totally. And this age, you know, whereas like a seven-year-old is much more likely to be used to getting dropped off at a camp where they don't know anybody and know how to quickly make those connections because that's just what is more typically happening at that age. Once you get kind of into that 11, 12, 13-year-old age, they're much less likely to want to go to a program where they don't know anybody, but that is such an important skill to build. So finding ways that you can still at that age in ways that they at least buy partly into, because otherwise you're never going to get them there, to try a new class or a new camp or take a hobby that they're interested in and try it out. Even if it's like a swim team or a, a cooking class, something like that, to make sure that they're getting out in the world besides their own household and their own few friends that they might text message, just making sure that they are still having those opportunities to stretch those social wings or finding a friend that's willing to do it with them so that they can make those other connections. And this is also a great age, like you mentioned, with the jobs. Like they really can get little jobs. They can do lawn mowing. They can be a mother's helper in the neighborhood. There are little jobs that they can get that one, make them some money to be buying those pool concessions, but then also, you know, give them a sense of responsibility and mattering and meaning that can be so huge and meaning. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, giving them the space to develop the activities that are, again, like meaningful and fun for them. It's likely going to be different than what's meaningful and fun for you. Yes. But that's kind of the beauty to watch them develop this desire to engage in something that is new and their own. Mm -hmm. And in summer can be a really great time for them to kind of dig into that. What maybe it's maybe it's art, drawing, and they doodle all year in class. And then in the summer, they can kind of dial that in and, and try something. And and now we have so many opportunities to do that. So it could be like YouTube videos, or it could be a drawing class, or it could be just like taking a sketch pad to a beautiful spot where you live, and just engaging in that to kind of see, oh, this is this is really great. This is fun. This is um, empowering, and I, and and helps develop skills. I think can be really a wonderful opportunity to do that in the summer for tweens. Totally. Well, I feel like the the threads here. I guess if we kind of look across the arc, I'll tell you what I see as the threads, and you can kind of fill in the gaps from our conversation from what you what you see. Is I I feel like it's a mix of creating some consistency and clarity about what the expectations or what the plan is going to be, obviously in the ways that are developmentally appropriate for your children or your students or campers. So it's that like clear expectations and clear communication about what the plan is, the taking advantage of unique opportunities that summer break presents between the programming opportunities and the weather, and then also just being incredibly honest with yourself about what your actual kids or your actual students need from the summer, even if it differs from what you need. And then honoring what you need too, even if it means that your kids aren't a part of that. I guess, would you say that that is sort of the arc of this or what, what am I missing here? Yes. 
I love that. I love that. I love that. I also love thinking about the job piece. Like it doesn't, and I don't mean just like a paid job, but just everybody can contribute. Everybody can participate in a way that they've made a commitment to. And then what we didn't talk about so much, but I think should have been a part is that family or counselor or leader Mm -hmm. or teacher connection piece to the child at any age. That can happen in a way that, I mean, Jamie, like I'm going to disclose, we went to the same summer camp together and because I just think it's more fun to really share. And we, we can remember our favorite camp counselors. We can remember mm-hmm. certain role models in that space. And I think that can be so powerful. Like our kids are going to remember the people who made the difference or the peers. Like another thing that JV and I would do together, we talked about this yesterday, was go to the same swim center. And there was, and I hope no one's listening who is going to be offended. This was like 30 years ago. It doesn't exist anymore. But there was nothing special <laughs> about that swim center. It was like a gross pool with like a weird clubhouse and a bad playground. Would you agree? 100%. Oh, yes. Oh, along the highway, the interstate. Okay. Along- there's nothing, <laughs> totally. There's nothing. Totally, those plastic chairs, yeah. 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 There's nothing like inherently special about it, except it was special. And like the relationship, the space, like the evening picnics, you know, that's what I remember about it. It's not like the quality of the clubhouse. So just just holding on to that. I'm like getting defensive because like, I'm like, you know, it was special, (laughs) but you're right. There was nothing like physically special about the space, but it, it like, it was the experiences. And the summer is such a unique time for that you know during the school year you often don't get to choose who your your stu- your children's role models are going to be who the, the adults that they interact with are going to be because they're assigned a sports team or they assigned a school teacher but in summer you do get to really infuse their connections web with really unique experiences and then because of that really unique connection so I love that you brought that yeah. in because that's so huge <laughs> uh-huh. I totally agree about the connections piece and when you were talking about the importance of the jobs as as far as providing meaning. It reminded me of this book called Never Enough by Jennifer Wallace. And this book was all about how the single most important thing you can do for your kids is to create a sense of mattering and how like having kids feel that they matter is the single biggest indicator of emotional health connection as they grow into adulthood. And so a job, a responsibility, a role in summer when, you know, the busyness of the school year is taking a break is such a beautiful opportunity for creating those those moments of mattering. And so I'll link that book in the show notes because I, I loved, loved, loved that book. But that's what your comment reminded me of. So I completely agree. Yeah, I love that. Yeah help kids understand that they matter, they're contributing and really part of a powerful dynamic in their community. Well, Rachel, the question that I ask everybody at the end of each episode is if you could wave a magic wand on behalf of kids in 2024, what would you wish for them and what messages would you tell them? Well, with the summer, this is a hard question, but with the summer, I would say I wish that kids... And I, my hope for kids is that they can take the time and the space to just be mm-hmm. and not focus on the doing or the, the fast paced nature of how crazy life can be, but really to just play and be and enjoy. I love that. And I will second that motion. Thank you so much for joining me and for being in it for youth. Can you please tell listeners how they can reach out to you if they want to learn more about their practice? Maybe they live by you or how they can you know, reach out to you if they have any further questions on any of these topics. Absolutely. So uh, my name is Rachel Yakar. You can go to my website, which is my name, www.racheliakar.com. You can find me as a Kinspire therapist, you can find me through Jamie. You can find me on Instagram, which will be at the bottom of the show notes because I don't even remember my handle. <laughs> okay, yes. We'll definitely we'll definitely link everything. <laughs> Thank you so much. I hope this is just the first of many, many visits to the show. Uh, you have so much expertise and I, of course, love chatting with you and certainly love recalling our summer days from when we were little. So thank you so much for being here. 
And thank you. This was such a pleasure. And I look forward to many more and just being together, working together, collaborating. And yeah, I'm here. Awesome. Well, thank you to all the listeners. We'll be back next time with another inspiring topic. In It For Youth is a Lit Path Studios production. Music is by Inspiring Audio and Pond5. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And to learn more about this show and all other shows on the network, visit www.litpathstudios.com.